Hey, my name's Brent. Welcome to 49cc Scoot. Today I'm going to be doing some pre-assembly measurements for the RC1. I'm going to begin by checking the crankshaft for true. And by true, basically what we mean is the crankshaft is running straight, so straight and true. Nothing is bent or pressed together wrong. There's nothing that causes an odd angle in there. Everything is nice and straight. So of course, I will need the crankshaft itself, and then you're gonna need at least one dial indicator and something to hold it. You can get these magnetic bases really cheap, lots of places, and I don't have a lot of money into these indicators. These are actually Shars, which if you look those up, you'll see they're not too expensive but they've been pretty good for me for whatever stuff that I've done around here. You don't have to have two, but that'll let you use one indicator on each side. You're also gonna need something to hold the crankshaft. So these are V-blocks, these are very popular. All you've gotta do with V-blocks is lay them out parallel to each other and then lay your crankshaft on top of them somewhere where it can be supported in a flat spot. So like you see these shoulders up here, right against the edge of the wheels put it on those and then that will allow you to easily turn the crankshaft and hold it in place so you can check. I've got a homemade option here as well. These are, I just call them bearing stands. Basically they're just stands. They've got little legs that are made up of just bolts and nuts so that I can level them out if I need to. And I've got a couple of bearings up here. They work basically like a V-block setup would where you set those parallel to each other and then I would set the crankshaft in there same way. And then that would let you rotate the crankshaft and check that way. So the V-blocks are really easy. These are kind of nice sometimes for certain parts. Um, and also if you don't have V-blocks around and don't want to buy them, I made this out of the uh, shipping container for one of my Chinese scooters. And then, of course, the bearings in here are really cheap. These small bearings, you can get just generic ones. They don't have to be anything fancy. Um, and just nuts and bolts to attach them to there. I'm gonna use the V-blocks for this. So I'm just gonna lay these down parallel to each other. And then I'll take my crankshaft and put that in there. Again, laying it on flat surfaces of the crank. I'm gonna kind of push it right up against the sides of the crank wheels just to make sure everything is parallel and then just back them off a little bit because if the crank is right up against those it creates too much friction and the crank won't turn easily so you want to make sure when you're in there that the crankshaft turns easily and the next thing that i need to do is set up my dial indicators and i'm going to tell you that it's nice to have a metal surface when you do this i've got a metal workbench top here so once I get these in place, I can turn the magnetic base on and then these don't move too much. You don't really have to have a metal workbench to do this. You could even lay down a piece of uh, sheet metal or something because the weight of the crankshaft, the V-blocks and the bases themselves will help to hold it down. But the more you can secure everything in place so there's less movement, the easier it's gonna be to take these measurements. When I'm setting up the dial indicator, what I wanna do is get the tip of the dial indicator onto one of the flat surfaces of the crankshaft. So you don't want to be on something like these splines. That's really tough to measure. It's not going to give you an accurate reading. You don't want to be on threads. Again, it's going to move around the dial indicator as the threads go around. If you have a taper like you've got over on this side for the flywheel or rotor, if you get on that taper and then the crankshaft moves side to side at all, that will throw off the readings and you won't be able to tell if you've got run out or not. So try to get on a nice flat surface that doesn't have any kind of an angle to it and do this as far away as you can from the center of the crankshaft because that'll give you a better reading. So in this case, on this side of the crank, I've got a nice flat surface that goes all the way out here. So I'm going to try to get my dial indicator right up here. And you want to put a little bit of uh, preload on there so you don't want it just barely touching. You want it to get that plunger to move just a little bit at least. And you're also trying to make sure that this is perpendicular. So you don't want this sitting at an angle like this, for example. You want that plunger going straight down on top of the crankshaft. Again, looking at this side, you can see this is clearly a straight section without an angle and it goes up 
right about to here and then from here out it's all tapered and I don't like the measure there so I'm going to get the dial indicator somewhere around here. You also want to make sure that the dial indicator is straight down this way so you don't want it tilted out like this or like this. Basically the goal is just to keep it in all aspects as straight down on top of the crankshaft as you can get it. Once both of those are set up then just rotate the crankshaft and make sure it's not really trying to move a lot side to side or anything that's going to throw it off. Then you can zero out your indicators. After you got those zeroed out, then rotate the crankshaft around and be careful not to bump or move anything any more than you absolutely have to. So, go real nice and slow. And just watch the dials. If those move, then that's telling you it's a little bit out of true. And this is looking really good, at least from my vantage point, I'm not really seeing the needles move. They may have quivered a little bit, but there's definitely not a whole lot in there. And some of this will be, if you watch, just if I push down on something a little bit or I even bump this with my hand, this is why you gotta be really careful. Just the slightest little tap or anything can throw off your measurements. So you gotta be really conscious of that. You can see I've already ruined the zero on mine just from bumping it around a little bit. Thankfully this crankshaft looks pretty good, but if yours is showing some run out, usually the maximum acceptable run out would be somewhere between one and two thousandths of an inch, or maybe up to about 0 0.05 millimeters. If it's beyond that, then you really should have it trued or true it yourself. And truing is kind of a scary process, but it is doable at home. So. What's scary about it is one of the things you may have to do to true a crankshaft is to use a softer hammer, something softer than the metal of the crank, like a copper or a brass hammer, and kind of tap it or smack it back into place. You don't just beat it randomly, you really have to know exactly what you're looking for. Um, or you may need to use a wedge to kind of spread the webs apart, or you may need to use a vise or even a press to press them back together in one spot a little more. And it's very important to understand exactly how the crankshaft is out of true because it can go out of true in multiple different ways. So I'm not gonna get into all of that here. I would actually suggest if you're familiar with Alex from Two Stroke Tuning, he has an excellent video where he explains this all and demonstrates it with a prop to really make it clear. So I'll put a link to that in the description and check that out. We now interrupt your regularly scheduled measurements for some unboxing. I'm going to make this pretty quick because this is not intended to be an unboxing video, but while I was doing those measurements, the UPS guy showed up because I'd ordered more stuff from scootertuning.ca. Again, those are our friends up there in Canada. They hooked me up with a discount and I am greatly appreciative of it. You should seriously check them out if you need some high performance scooter parts. So the main thing in here that I wanted to show you is the rear fender mud guard, they call it. I did decide to pick up the Melosi mudguard. Originally I wasn't going to get it, but then I started looking at the way these carburetors are right over top of the back wheel and I just didn't like the idea of not having anything to protect it from mud and road debris. So I did pick that up from them. And then all the other stuff is going to be spare kickstart parts. So spring, that's mudguard bolts I guess, um, the pinion there kickstart part, whatever you call that little thing. Another lever. Oh, I did get a clutch bell tool. Um, just kind of wanted to have one. That's another bushing for the CVT cover. And I also had to get some extra circlips. Wanted to have some around. And that should be it. So yeah, basically it makes me a little bit nervous not to have any kind of spare kickstart parts around. So I picked up some spares that way. If anything happens to it, I've got them. And again, big thanks to scootertuning.ca. Next up, I'm going to be measuring the cylinder and the piston. Now this isn't something that a lot of people do when they put together a small engine, but it's not a bad idea. I found that with the last engine that I had, when I was trying to check it for wear, 
I really wished I had the initial specs of everything to compare. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and take those measurements myself and then I've got it for later, even though Melosi does provide a piston to cylinder clearance spec. You're going to need some tools to take these measurements, so here's a common selection of tools that people may use for this. So I'll start off here with feeler gauges. These are definitely not the preferred option. They can sort of work in a pinch if you're just looking to find the clearance, but it may not be that accurate. It can be semi-accurate, but it's not going to be the most accurate method for sure. So say a 2000s fit and a 3000s would not fit, then you know the clearance was somewhere between there. With the other tools, you're going to try to be much more precise than that. I guess the next kind of best option would be a set of calipers like this. And these can work, but they may or may not be terribly accurate. They're definitely not going to be the most accurate, but you may be able to get by with something like this, especially if you pair those with another option like the snap gauges or telescoping gauges. These things, they'll tell you which bore sizes they're meant for. You just loosen these up, they'll lock in place. So you got to loosen them so they move freely. And you would put that in the cylinder, move it around, wiggle it around until it feels like you've got the right measurement, tighten it up, and then you can measure this. And you can measure these snap gauges with calipers like this, or you can use the next tool, tool I'm going to tell you about here, which is a micrometer. Hopefully you're familiar with these, but basically this is just a caliper that can take very precise measurements. In the case of this one, it can take down to one ten thousandths of an inch measurement. So that is one of the two preferred tools for this, paired with this tool, which is a dial bore gauge. And this is meant specifically for measuring bores. It's got this little head on here and this little sort of button, we'll call it. And when this button is depressed by pushing it up against the cylinder wall, it then moves your dial indicator. And that will allow you to take very precise measurements. So in this case, you can see this thing is graduated to a half of a thousandth or five ten thousandths of an inch. So you can be at least that specific. Um, you have at least that much resolution with this. And that is a very accurate and repeatable way to take these kinds of measurements. So most people would recommend a micrometer and the dial bore gauge. Before I use the mic and the dial bore gauge, I am going to show you how the feeler gauges work. And I think it may be interesting just to compare what we come up with here versus what I come up with later with the more precision instruments. So Melosi says that the clearance here should be right around two thousandths of an inch. I've got a two thousandth of an inch feeler gauge. I'm going to put just a little bit of two stroke oil on there. It's a lot more than I wanted. Then I will take my piston. I'm going to insert it just like it would normally be. So the arrow is going to face the exhaust ports. Drop that down in there. And then I'm going to check all around with this two thousandth of an inch feeler gauge and see how it fits. So up top, that fits pretty easily. I can move it all the way around. Also gonna check around the bottom, see how that is. I know I've got at least two thousandths of an inch of clearance. So let's see, my next step up is gonna be two and a half. I should have a three thousandths in here. Again, top of the bore. I can get that three thousandths feeler in there. So down at the bottom, this is really snug. I'm gonna go ahead and check with a four thousandths up top just to see if that does fit or not. That's more snug than what I would call four thousandths of an inch clearance. I can get it started in there on the sides and I can get it started there, but that's very tight. Based on that, I would guess maybe three to three and a half thousandths of an inch of clearance there. But again, realistically, this isn't the method that most people would like to see you use if you're trying to go for clearance measurements. And again, it will not tell you bore size or piston size. Now I'm going to need a place to record my measurements and I need to know what I'm going to be measuring with the micrometer and the dial bore gauge. And that's where this sheet comes in. I made this up and I've got it up on my website so you can print this out if it's helpful to you. And this is first off a place to record all of your measurements from piston diameter, bore diameter, clearance, uh, you can do out of round and taper calculations and put them in here. Also has a place for a title. So it's a good idea if you're doing this to put what cylinder you're measuring, maybe put a date, 
mileage or if it's brand new, etc. Then up top, I've got a little kind of table or whatever you call it, where it shows you exactly what you should be measuring here. So first off, you can see the piston. I know that I'm gonna measure that around 10 millimeters from the bottom. And also, if you have any sort of manufacturer specifications for how to measure these things, follow those. But in general, I'm gonna measure around 10 millimeters from the bottom of the piston, and I'm gonna measure 90 degrees off or perpendicular to the pin axis. So this would be the pin axis. I'm not gonna measure it here. I'm gonna measure 90 degrees off or perpendicular, so I'm gonna measure this way. So 10 millimeters up and this way. You've got A, B, and C here marked on this little cylinder representation. A being the top of the cylinder, which is usually stated to be five to 15 millimeters from the top or from the deck. You'll also wanna measure just below the ports and then just above the cutouts for C there. That means just above right here in the cylinder skirts where everything's cut out. Also, you'll see you're gonna to wanna to measure on the X and the Y axis for each one of those. So you'll have two measurements for A, that's A X and A Y, same for B and C. So the X axis I'm calling the pin axis, and then the Y axis will be 90 degrees to that, perpendicular to that, or the thrust axis, I guess you could call it. I'll start with a piston. So I'm gonna use the micrometer to measure this, and I've got it set up in my vise. Now this could be partially personal preference, but I like to have my mic in a vise. When you do put it in a vise, or if you choose to, I'm using soft jaws, so they've got aluminum and then a rubber pad on there, and I'm also not putting a lot of force on it. These are precision instruments, so you don't abuse them. Just clamp it in there enough that it's gonna stay still. One thing that's very important when using a micrometer is to make sure it's calibrated and zeroed out. So it should come with a standard. For example, this is a two to three inch micrometer and it comes with a two inch standard. So all you've got to do, make sure everything's clean and then hold that standard in there and dial down on it. I use this ratcheting thimble because I believe that's the most repeatable and accurate method, at least for me. But dial down on there. I'm gonna wait until it clicks a few times. You can check the feel if you'd like. For me, usually with a standard, it'll hold the standard in place, but it's pretty easy to move around in there. So it's not gripping it really, really tightly. Then take a good close look at the thimble and you should see that the zero is aligned with the first line here. If those aren't precisely aligned, then check the manual that came with your micrometer, but most likely it's gonna come with a tool that looks kind of like this. And that will allow you to rotate this barrel and get those to be very, very precisely aligned. And that's important because if you are off of the standard, that none of your measurements are actually going to be correct. I want to measure perpendicular to the pin bore, so not as the pin's going through, but across this way, and then not too far below the pin bore. So I want to basically measure just above this, across this way. And you got to be careful with this. You're going to kind of have to wiggle the piston around, make sure you get the proper part, because you don't want to try to measure, obviously, here. You want to make sure it's centered and then dial this in, try to keep it upright. Then I'm gonna wiggle it a little bit more. Check my location here. When you're doing these measurements, if your micrometer has the little readout here like mine does that goes to a thousandth of an inch, that's not good enough. You shouldn't be watching that. What you need to do for an accurate measurement is check all these graduations up here on the cylinder and see where it is to the nearest ten thousandth of an inch. In my case, when I read these graduations, I can add another four ten thousandths of an inch. That's where the lines meet up the best. They're closest to a line right there on the four. So my measurement is two and forty-four thousandths plus another four ten thousandths, two point zero four 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 inches. The reason that I'm not writing that down for my final measurement for the piston is because I like to do this at least a few times. So sort of like carpentry, they say measure twice and cut once. Well, in this case, I say measure at least three times and write it down once. Now I need to set up my dial bore gauge. So normally the way they are stored in the case and the way they come is they have one of the heads installed they typically have a couple of heads because they do different ranges. 
and the dial indicator is not installed on there. So the first thing for me is to select the proper head that I'm gonna need. And you'll see the one that came on there is labeled two to six inch. And the other one that I can swap it out for is 1.4 to two inch. I know that my bore is above two inches, so I'm gonna stick with this one. If not, then you can just unscrew this and screw the other one on there. Also with those, you have these little adapters. If I unscrew this, you can see I've already selected this, but you've got an adapter in there and you can also use spacers. You can see there's a whole bunch of different adapters on here and they will tell you what they're meant for, for what bore size. So for something like this, I've got it set up so that I can use it with my little over two inch bore. You may be doing say a four inch cylinder and then you might need to put one of these really long ones on there, but go over your instructions. They should tell you what you need. An easy way to find out if you've got this correct or close enough is just to put it in the cylinder. So when you put it in there, you should see that the little button or the nub here on this side will contact the cylinder wall. And then the anvil here on this side will also contact the cylinder wall. And you should have some play. You can see this little piece that slides in and out. You should have some ability to move that around. It shouldn't be bottomed out anywhere. That looks good. So now I need to install the dial indicator and that's just gonna slide into the end. So I can put that in. You wanna make sure that you start to see this needle move when you insert it. They say at least one revolution. So go one revolution, roughly. And also, before you lock that down, make sure the viewing angle is good for you. So you wanna make sure that however you're gonna be holding this, you got a good line of sight to the gauge. So all you gotta do is just twist that around till it's convenient, and then lock this down. Don't put a whole lot of pressure on that, but just make sure it's snug. Now it's time to measure the cylinder. So I've got mine sitting in a vise. You do not need to put the cylinder in a vise. And in fact, if you do, be very careful when you're gripping against the cylinder skirts. You don't want to break those off. For me, this is primarily because it's easy to set up a light under here and easy to film. As I showed you earlier from the worksheet, we're going to take essentially six measurements inside of the cylinder. So again, around 10 millimeters from the top, we're going to take an X and a Y, pin axis, thrust axis. Then we're going to move down just below the port floors. Same deal, X and Y. And then down near the bottom, basically as close to the bottom as we can get past the cutouts, X and Y. I'm gonna take my dial bore gauge, we'll start here on the pin axis, and I'm gonna insert that into the cylinder and try to be roughly 10 millimeters from the top with each one of the tips on here. Now I'm gonna rock this back and forth. As I do that, you'll see that the needle on the dial indicator is also rocking back and forth. Now I need to zero my dial indicator right where the needle is turning around. So if you watch, you'll see it comes up towards zero. It'll slow and stop and then go back the other way. Same deal when I rock it back, it's turning around there. So I wanna zero in right on the point where it's turning around. So make a rough adjustment first. I'm just gonna move this over in the vicinity. Do this a little more. and just keep working it until you're confident that you're right on that zero. That looks good to me. So next step is to go ahead and lock that down. And after I lock it, I like to give it a double check to make sure I didn't move anything. It still looks good. And now I can take this out of the cylinder. Now I've got my mic set up in the vise again because I'm gonna use it to measure my dial bore indicator. So I'm gonna put the head here right between the two posts on the dial indicator and I'm gonna to begin to move that in. Once you start to make contact, then you'll see that the dial indicator needle starts moving. I'm gonna to continue to tighten this down because I'm trying to get this to zero out. So I wanna replicate the cylinder basically with my mic. I want this dial bore gauge to be able to rock back and forth and wind up on the zero. Now what's very important here is to keep track of how many times the needle goes around on your dial indicator. Because if you set this up and the needle goes around twice when it's in your cylinder and you measure it on the first time it goes around here, you're gonna be off. So if you have to, 
go back and put this in your cylinder again and count how many revolutions. For me, it's on the first revolution. As I get close to the zero, I'm gonna slow way down. And now I'm gonna start rocking this back and forth because this is just like inside of the cylinder where I want this needle to wind up on the zero right as it's trying to turn around. At least for me, trying to get zeroed out with my dial bore gauge inside of the micrometer is more difficult than it is inside of the bore of the cylinder. And that's because in the bore of the cylinder, it's rounded and these are two flat surfaces. So you can not only be off this way, but also like this. So what I like to do is basically twist this and watch the needle until it goes the highest. Once I've got that, then I'll work this way. And you kind of have to go back and forth doing the two of those until you can find your best measurement. So I'm fairly close there. I need to dial this in a bit more. This is as close as I can get it. It's right as it turns around, it is on that zero. Now I can remove this from the micrometer and being really careful not to move anything, you should either have a lever or a dial to lock this in place. Go ahead and do that. Once I lock that in place, I am gonna put it back in there and just give it a double check to make sure that I'm still on zero. That looks good. So now I can take my measurement. So in my case, two inches plus 25 plus a 22 here. And then it looks like it aligns with a two the best there. So that would be 2.0472. And actually a 52 millimeter bore should be 2.0472 in inches. Before I write that down, I'll grab the cylinder again. I'm gonna do another check in there. Once I do another check in there, I will recheck it in my mic just to be 100% sure and then go back and do the same thing again because it's very easy to get off of these measurements so you want to take all the steps you can to ensure that you're being accurate. After writing down the measurement for the pin axis, now I can go ahead and do the thrust axis. Exact same process, you're probably going to be pretty close so it's a good idea to leave your micrometer kind of dialed in where it was as well as your bore gauge and you should only have to make small adjustments to those. I'm not gonna show you all of these measurements because they're exactly the same process. I have just flipped the cylinder over here. That way you can see where the other measurements are gonna be taken. So the next set would be just below the port floors. It's gonna be easier to get in there if you flip the cylinder over. That way you don't have to navigate your uh, dial bore gauge around the ports. Hope you can see that it's just below the port floor. It's actually gonna look like it's just above it from the way you're looking at it now. And then the other one is gonna be right up here, just shy of the cylinder cutouts. I wanna point out something now because I've never heard it mentioned before. And I'm assuming I'm not the only person that's ever happened to. I had a bunch of inconsistencies in my measurements. They were pretty much inconsistent within about a little less than a half a thousand. I kept measuring and measuring and measuring and I just couldn't figure out why it would be off. And just now, I finally realized I believe what has been happening. So let me show you. On the top of the dial bore gauge is a dial indicator. I'm gonna use a dial indicator here because it does what I wanna show you more consistently. But with dial indicators, I'm sure most of you that have used them know that sometimes they won't always return exactly to where they're zeroed. So especially if it bounces or something, you can see that it may be a little bit off depending exactly how that lands again. The one on this dial bore indicator is actually pretty good about that. And most of the time it returns to where it lands. That's why I wasn't using it for the demonstration. But what I happened to notice was at one point my measurements suddenly went awry. They were different than what they were before. And I noticed that this needle here, when it was outside of the bore, was set just a little bit off of that five. And when it was wrong, it was even further away from that. And then I bounced the thing and it came back and then my measurements changed back to where they were. Now, I wouldn't have thought that just that little bit of difference there with how it sort of bounced back and how it seated, I wouldn't have thought that would have made that difference. I thought it probably would seat itself however it needed to under pressure but I've actually done it and it did change my measurements. So it seems that that is what was causing the inconsistencies for me and I wanted to mention it. 
to be both more gentle on the instrument as well as potentially more consistent, it'd be a good idea to kind of guide this out, put it at an angle and let it just work its way back to seated and then pull it out of there and maybe that'll save you some headaches. After a bunch of measuring and conversions, this is what I came up with. If you look at the bore dimensions, you'll see that at the top of the cylinder, it's almost right on 52 millimeters. 51.999 is what it converts to. And then it goes and tapers down or tapers up, however you want to look at it, to 52.014 millimeters or 2.0478 inches. So it's got about six ten thousandths of an inch of taper, which is pretty good. Uh, the out of round is zero. And then on the clearance, you can see that that ranges from just under three thousandths of an inch to almost three and a half thousandths of an inch for me. Unfortunately, I'm not within Melosi specs. So in their manual for this cylinder kit, they state it as piston to cylinder play, and they say it is 0.048 to 0.056 millimeters, which converted comes out to about one thousandths plus nine ten thousandths, so just shy of two thousandths of an inch, or two thousandths and two ten thousandths. So basically right around two thousandths of an inch is what they want for piston to cylinder clearance or play they call it. And I'm coming out almost three thousandths to over three thousandths, almost three and a half, which I'm not terribly thrilled about. And it's actually caused me a lot of work because I thought I have to be way off in my measurements because this cylinder shouldn't have that much play. When I started measuring the cylinder, I was using the method that I've used for pretty much everything I've ever done with a dial bore gauge and I was measuring for cylinder clearance specifically. So I would actually measure the piston and then I would set my micrometer to the piston diameter and then I would set my bore gauge to zero on piston diameter. So when I put the bore gauge inside of the cylinder, then whatever it showed me on the bore gauge on the dial indicator for that was my clearance. So I was trying to directly measure clearance and it came out the first time I did it to three and a half to four thousandths of an inch of clearance. And then I switched around I started talking to the guys on the forum and it was suggested that I try it the other way, which is the way a lot of other people do it, where you do it just like I just showed you. And you are actually zeroing inside of the cylinder and then measuring your dial bore gauge and seeing exactly what it is on a micrometer. Now I had tried this before when I first started using a dial bore gauge and to me it just seemed like a lot more effort. It was harder to do and I seemed to be getting the same results. However, I had that sort of aha moment when I was doing it this way this time after really scrutinizing my measurements and I realized that when you're doing this the way I used to you're trying to take a precise measurement with your dial bore gauge and my indicator on there is graduated in five ten thousandths or half thousandths of an inch so basically I would note something as zero or a half thousandths and then I'd usually put a plus or a minus if it was a little over or a little under but it wasn't very specific when you do it the way that I just showed you, instead of having that sort of resolution, you then move on to the micrometer and you, as long as you zero out as close as you can get it when you're in the dial bore gauge in the cylinder, then when you go to the micrometer, you're back to your 10, one ten thousandth of an inch um, resolution. So you can actually be more accurate that way. And instead of just writing, say three and a half thousandths minus or three thousandths plus, you can write down a real number and figure out what it is. Now that said, there's a lot of inaccuracy, especially in my dial bore gauge, which says total error could be nine, ten thousandths of an inch. So almost a thousandth of an inch, it says could be in total error and repeatability. It only has listed as four ten thousandths of an inch. So no matter how hard you try with the level of tools that I have and probably the level of uh, ability that I have, you're just not going to get spot on every time. So I may not be on to the 10 thousandths for sure. Um, but anyway, I've certainly learned along the way and eventually I got to these numbers and I'm fairly pleased with them, but I'm still not really happy with how far off of the clearance I am. But that's why I initially started going through all of these measurements and measuring it over and over again, painstakingly spent way too much time trying to take these measurements because I thought, you know, there's no way this thing should be three and a half to four thousandths of an inch off. And it looks like now maybe it's more like three to three and a half at most off, but I just didn't expect it to be that far off. So I don't think I'm going to do anything about it right now because it's not a really wild spec. My TPR kit has had similar specs with new pistons and it runs good for quite a while. 
Uh, if it were a little bit tighter, it may run a little bit better, possibly, and a little bit longer, but I think it's gonna be okay. I don't really wanna cause a fuss about it. I'm sure scootertuning.ca would hook me up if I just told them, look, I think something's out of spec. I've really scrutinized my piston measurement because it's coming out at, let's see, what is it exactly? 51.928 millimeters is what it says or 2.0444 in inches. But I was expecting the piston to be about 51.95 millimeters. That's pretty common for pistons to be right around there because if you've got say a 52 millimeter bore and you take off 0 0.05 millimeters, 51.95 millimeters, that makes the two thousandths of an inch clearance that a lot of people or a lot of manufacturers are looking for. So it's fairly common to be there and I was sort of expecting that, but it turns out my piston is more like 51.93 millimeters. So I don't know if that's correct and this is how they all are, or if my piston's a little undersized. I've really tried to make sure that my measurements are correct. I've even gone as far as checking my standards and other micrometers um, and measuring the piston in another micrometer and it's coming out the same. I even got out my digital caliper, tried to measure in there, even though it's not terribly accurate, and it's got a 0 .0005 resolution, so a half a thousandth resolution. It came out to 2.0445, so pretty much right on the number I measured. So as far as I can tell, I'm accurate with that piston measurement, and I don't know if that is actually a little undersized or that's standard, because unfortunately, so far, I haven't found anybody that has measured their kit before they put it on, so I have no way of knowing, and Molosi doesn't seem to publish that spec that I've seen. So at any rate, those are my measurements. I've taken great care to be as accurate as I can be with them. And I guess I'm just gonna deal with whatever clearance I've got. That's gonna do it for this video. Please be sure to give it a like if you enjoyed it or found it helpful and make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any of the RC1 series. Thank you for watching.